Good evening. Good evening. I hereby call this February the 8th meeting of the Public Safety Committee to order. Uh, we have a fairly full agenda today. Uh, joining us uh, today is our city manager and his staff, led by Mr. Lee Garrity. Also see our chief of police, Chief Roundtree, uh, our director of emergency management, Mr. Sattler, and our fire chief, uh, Chief Mayo. Uh, I'm sure when you call names, you're going to forget somebody, but I thank everyone for being here today. Uh, there are four items on the general agenda. We have an item considering the state mandated schedule for fire prevention code inspections. Uh, there's another item giving us an update on the 2015 preliminary crime statistics, uh, 2015 emergency management year in review, and then there's an update on Novak Street speed study. Items on the consent agenda are unanimously approved unless a member of the committee wishes to be pulled for further discussion. With that being said, members of the committee, are there any items that should be pulled for consideration? If not, I would entertain a motion. Second. Second. Motion and properly seconded. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. That is unanimous. The consent agenda is approved. Item G1, please. Item G1, consideration of the state mandated schedule for fire prevention code inspections. And giving us uh, the memo would be our fire chief, Chief Mayo. You have the floor, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. Madam Mayor Pro Tem, members of the committee. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, put a proposal before you this afternoon with perhaps a favorable recommendation to the full council, and it is that we uh, change the way that we are currently conducting fire safety, uh, code, fire code inspections related to fire safety. So uh, what we are currently doing is uh, we are conducting fire code inspections at a on a schedule that is above what is required by the state of North Carolina and recommended by the uh, National Fire Protection Association. And those are, those, both of those bodies uh, are very serious about fire protection and particularly, particularly the uh, National Fire Protection Association. They have uh, recommended standards for every, almost everything uh, the fire service does. And uh, on some of them, I could make a pretty strong argument to, to you that they are excessive. Um, so, you know, I say all that to say this, uh, when you consider that they can get carried away sometimes on the excess, uh, it's interesting to me that we are going even beyond what uh, a body like that recommends in terms of uh, code enforcement. So. Uh, we are, as, as best we can determine, the only city in the state of North Carolina that is, in, that is doing uh, fire code inspections on a schedule that is above what the state uh, mandate requires. Uh, we, uh, the city of Winston-Salem, uh, adopted uh, the, the current schedule in 1975, and the history on this is a little bit fuzzy uh, as to how we landed on this schedule that is above what is required and what everybody else is doing. Um, but you can see there uh, how we conduct our uh, inspections. This is what is currently required. Uh, we adopted this and reported it to the Office of State Fire Marshal and so this is, this is what we're sort of bound by code to do. Uh, what gets us in trouble is, you see there in the second bullet, all other occupancies. Well, that includes businesses and mercantile, and that's where the bulk of your inspections are. So that's what's loading us up so heavily. And then, you, you know, you see there in the last bullet that last year uh, for inspections and reinspections, we are, we're conducting over 16,000 a year. We have a reinspection rate of about 23%. That means we go into a business, we find violations, and then we have to go back for, you know, to make sure that those violations have been followed up on. So the reason everybody else is, and, and let, me, let me tell you this uh, for, for, you know, so that I don't get my britches hung on my own pitchfork. The, uh, the, the city of High Point has a, uh, they are still doing some operations-based inspections, but they have identified the flaws with that program, and they are, they are on a schedule to move those operations inspections into their Fire Prevention Bureau. Uh, but beyond them, we're the only ones that are full speed ahead for municipality anywhere near our size. The, the operations based, the, the reason other municipalities have abandoned these programs is because they have a history of poor performance. 
uh, operations inspectors will not find the same number of code violations that a dedicated fire inspector will find. Uh, they are not very high on customer service. What happens is, so we, we send in-service companies out, like, you know, a fire truck with, with three or four individuals on it to, to conduct a fire, a fire inspection, and they are in service for emergency calls. So you have somebody who's trying to run a business. We are in interrupting their business to, to conduct an inspection. We have an emergency call. The crew leaves in the middle of the inspection. Then they have to go back. You know, paperwork is left incomplete. Paperwork is not left at all. We field Chief Owens back here. He's the fire marshal, of course, Assistant Chief Bob Owens. Um, he and I field far more complaints about operations inspectors than we do about fire prevention bureau inspectors and it's just because of the nature of a lot of it is because of the nature of the way the operations inspection program has to be conducted chief can i interrupt you here just first sure that's where the definition of fire prevention bureau versus operations because it's not immediately apparent when you read the report what the, the distinction is between the two and i apologize for the jargon yeah. uh, so the operations division are the, the fire trucks and the you know so that's, that's about 88 percent of our personnel are in the operations division they are the ones who are actually putting the emergency services component of our operation on the streets the fire prevention bureau uh, works out of chief chief owens office and they are dedicated plans reviewers fire inspectors in, in code enforcement and fire investigators so they are specialists in the field and they are doing those investigations inspections plans review all the time they're on an eight to five schedule where everybody in the operations division is on a platoon they're, they're working a shift rotation um, so the uh, and i think let me see if my map is coming up next so the last bullet here is the thing that concerns me most and i'll show you why uh, and I'm going to step around. So this gray area that you see, uh, if you see here, I know for some of it's kind of hard to see, but the purple star, so that was a recent house fire we had on Becker Church Road. And I, I pulled it because when I walked in our regular specialist office, it was the one laying on top. So I said, just, just pull the day for that problem. So when this, when this house fire got dispatched, we emptied out everything you see in gray to send the appropriate resources that's 39.3 square miles of the city of Winston Salem is devoid. Devoid? It's void. They don't have any fire protection because all the fire stations in that area are emptied out to send appropriate resources to the fire. Now this call happened at 2 o'clock in the morning, which is which makes it a lot easier for us to what I call move up resources. So um, when when you look at the rest of the map, all the stuff in color we would reassign some of those resources up north to try to help fill in that gap. However, and this call came in about 2 o'clock in the morning, and we had units on the scene. As soon as we start getting things in hand, we start clearing units as, as quickly as possible to get them back in service for other calls. But we had uh, some resources on that scene until 7 o'clock that morning. So that's five hours that we have resources pulled out of their response areas for that one incident. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, no problem for us to fill in that coverage gap. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon, that stuff you see in color, you've got three or four of those units are already on other calls. And it, it is very challenging for us to move what remains up and fill in that gap because if you take these companies out of their territories, they are in some cases so heavily loaded on fire inspections they can't can, they can't get their non-emergency workload done so we we sort of find ourselves in a in a tricky situation in being able to fill in these coverage gaps and still accomplish what we have reported to the state that we're doing in terms of conducting these fire inspections and, and that is that is my number one concern is is we just don't the the inspection load handcuffs us in terms of deploying resources that are available when we have a, an opening in coverage like this 
This is, this is the, so this next bullet answers the question that I was most curious about when we started down this path toward data analysis. Uh, and what we found is, based on the number of inspectable occupancies, you know, we don't inspect any, we don't, we, you know, a man's house is his castle. Uh, we don't go in anybody's single family residence. When we go to apartment buildings and places like that, we can only inspect the common areas, stairwells, recreation areas, office spaces. We don't get to go in anybody's apartment. That's by law. Um, but for inspectable occupancies, we show no difference between Winston-Salem and other municipalities, our peer municipalities, in terms of the number of fires we have doing inspections as often as we do compared to what other people do, which is inspect on the state schedule. In other words, we're not receiving any benefit from this. Um, and then the next thing you see here is, so to, and if you, if you read the memo, I said that we have nine, to, to operate this program that we do, we have nine times the number of inspectors that the city of Charlotte does. And you know how much larger Charlotte is than Winston. Uh, so we require all of our company officers to be level two fire inspectors in order to make this program go. So that exam is challenging, but, but our folks can, 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 can pass the test, pass the state exam. What, what, what bothers me is that that exam is $120. And you say, well, you know, that's not a lot of money. And we reimburse people, our employees, we reimburse them when they pass the test. But they may take it two or three times before they actually pass it. And for those couple of times, two or three times that they may have to take it before they pass it, we, no reimbursement. And we literally have some employees who at the end of the month, they don't have $120 to take the test. So what, what we have here is the entire ship of the fire department sits lower in the water because people who would be getting ready to compete for company officer, they, get, they wait until they get this first. So the other things we require them to do to be ready to test for company officer, they don't get those things until they do this first. So, you know, in terms of fire officer certifications and, and other things that we require them to do that would make them better, no matter what position they're, they're assigned, they don't have those things because they're, they're waiting to pass the test, they're waiting to save the money to be able to take the test. So, you know, that, that, that's a concern. The, right. chief, the, the test you're referring to is administered by a private company. It, it is. It's, it, it's, it's a computer-based uh, test that uh, the state of North Carolina contracts uh, with a company to, to administer that test. Uh, and, and I'll give you an example of the effect. Right now, we have 11 company officer openings, captain of vacancies. And we just ran a captain's assessment process, and we only have five people that was eligible to compete, and that right there is what's keeping them from out of their eligibility. So the recommendation, as I said, is that we adopt the state-mandated and NFPA-recommended schedule, and that we, I'm, I'm not going to read this to you, but we would drop back to, to conducting inspections on the schedule that is laid out here. Uh, and you see what would happen, we would go from over, over 16,000 inspections a year to just over 80, 83, uh, almost 8,400, including re-inspections, which is almost a 50% reduction in that non-emergency workload. We also would recommend, because, um, I, I'll, I'll tell you what, what happens in actuality. We have instances where we have company level inspectors, those operations inspectors will go into a business for three or four years in a row and they'll find sometimes no code violations. They might find one or two. And, and something will get changed around and that occupancy will get handed over to a, to a prevention bureau inspector and they'll come out of there with two pages of violations. The quality of the inspections are much higher with inspectors who do it all the time. You know, the, 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 you know, uh, 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 an analogy would be, you know, you don't go to your dentist to have your tonsils removed. You know, your dentist and the ENT, they're working in a very similar area, but, you know, unless you, anytime you have a choice, you're going to go to that specialist. Our, our prevention bureau folks are the specialists in code enforcement, and it is our recommendation 
that we fully turn the code enforcement program over to the folks who are specialists in the field and are doing those quality inspections. We're going to have more, we're going to have a better program doing it less often with folks who are good at what they're doing versus having your dentist take your tonsils out. So to do that, uh, we estimate that we would need three additional employees in the Prevention Bureau, and it would take us three years to get on uh, to get on the schedule we need to be because, you know, we did them all this year. We can't wait three years to do them again because we'd be right back in the same place three years from now. So the ones we do this year, we'll have to do a third next year, a third in the second year, and a third in the third year. And then in 2019, we would be fully up to speed with the program, and we would just need to add uh, one of those additional inspectors each year for the next three years. And as we did that, the, uh, the, the operations division would accordingly th shed about a third of their, uh, of their inspection load. And there you see um, these costs you see here are salaries, uniforms, uh, uh, radios, vehicles, everything. That's an all-inclusive price. That's why you see it go down in year four is, is there's no equipment. Uh, calculated in in that year four. In year four, it will be salaries and benefits only going forward. So again, to recap, we'd have be a better inspection program, much better. Uh, it'd be more customer friendly. Uh, the, the enforcement program, you know, you would see more consistency in the code enforcement program. Um, we, we have some folks who, uh, we have some companies who are not accomplishing near the fire, rescue, and EMS training that they should be because they are just swamped with, I mean, from the time they come in in the morning and get their equipment checked off, they're doing inspections almost the whole day just to keep up with that load. Um, and then you see the thing that is, again, most important to me uh, is that ability to move, to move units around to, to fill in these coverage gaps that we create with calls and with multi-company trainings. And then again, the morale boost, and that goes back to uh, the third bullet down and you know we have folks in the operations division who know they are not providing the level of operations services those emergency services that they should be because the, the inspection program prevents them from doing the training that gets them to the level that they know they should be for a fully career fire department so that's it for me I'll entertain any questions you have Chief, I'll start by saying I think we all agree that it is extremely difficult to put a cost on safety. And it's our mandate to do that as this committee and as the city is concerned. I particularly like your plan because it shifts the focus on prevention and more or less away from being reactive to cost of service, especially when you outlined clearly uh, the need for it uh, in the city. So members of the committee, are there any questions for the chief at this particular time? Okay. We'll, we'll yield to Mayor Pro Tempur. Thank you. I, I felt that to be very interesting. And also, there's been complaints about the big trucks going out, using all that energy to these businesses, disrupting businesses. And I think if you look at some of the back history, you will see that some of us on this council are, you know, all felt there needs to be a change. And I think that change would be positive. Thank you. Councilmember McIntosh. I know, I know an awful lot of what drives fire policy is insurance ratings. And what I'm gathering from the report and from what you're saying tonight is that there'll be no net effect on our city in terms of our, the cost of insurance, the cost of our homeowners insurance, because we will not, we will be within guidelines from state regulatory agencies. Uh, right. There's a very good chance that there will be a net positive right. effect on insurance because, because of what you talked about. One of the coverage. one of the places that you can make up a lot of points towards your ISO grade is with training, and that's something we're not doing a very good job of right now because we're overloaded with this with these with these inspections. Right. And similar to the discussion that we just went through with the pay raise, I, I do feel like is that two hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year? Is that a net number? Because I feel like there will be some cost savings achieved through the program. It's not just all going to be expensive. We'll, we'll spend less money on diesel. We'll spend less money on wear and tear on the engines, et cetera. Yes, there's a, I've, well, um, we have, our, our apparatus have 
this is another another discussion, but we have unusually high <coughs> mileage on our apparatus, and and I believe that that part of that, at least part of it, is rooted in the fact that they are accruing so many miles back and forth, um, doing enforcing doing the code enforcement program. And the cost of replacing a Chevy Blazer is probably a whole lot less than an American or France. Uh, you don't really, you probably really don't even want to talk about what a fire truck costs. <laughs> the other point I want to I want to bring up is that I know. In the business community, there's always there's been a lot of friction. I don't know that it's as bad as it has been previously, but um, the feeling that the business community community gets punished or overregulated, over inspected, and to me, this goes a long way towards building a rapport. You've got, and the reason I asked about the, the distinction between um, the prevention bureau and the operations base is that you're, the new group that will be doing this will be an administrative staff, and that's their entire job. They'll just come at it with a different, I think, sense of purpose, and I think that will be a sense of purpose that will be understood by the business community much better. And I, I think a lot of that, I think a lot of friction has gone away, but I think this will go a long way towards uh, reducing that even further. So I, I, I think you're exactly, I think you're exactly right. And, and Mr. Chairman, if I may, please do. Uh, speaking to your comment about the value of this program, I have, um, you know, so it's easy to tell you what this program is going to cost in terms of salaries. I can tell you what it costs to operate a fire truck every year, but uh, I, I, I found your comment interesting because I have a colleague in Chapel Hill, um, and the the uh, the below the signature of his email it says, "Fire prevention is the most." And I'm paraphrasing, but essentially, fire prevention is the most cost-effective way of providing fire suppression, but it is the most difficult to monetize. I think that's a good way to end. Uh, members of the committee, this item appears to be for informational purposes only. Uh, Mr. City Manager, it sounds like the general consensus is to move forward with consideration of the positions and the implementation of the plan. I imagine we might see this in the public safety budget in this year's budget process. So if you'll talk a little bit about that, please. Uh, yeah, I, there are a couple things we'll have to do. One, add the position in the budget. But we also need to change the city code. So you'll probably see some of the information coming back for action sooner than, sooner than May. Thank you, sir. Anyone else need to be heard on this item? Mr. Chairman. Mayor Pro Tem Burke. I could not let this pass without saying to the chief, go back and research some of the public safety committee. And I combed that phrase a long time ago. There is no dollar sign mm -hmm. that we put before public safety. And I took it from Councilman Burke. <laughs> Stolen fair. <laughs> yes, it's fair and square. <laughs> we, we appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thanks. Thank you, Chief. Members of the committee, uh, we have a need to move item G4 forward to uh, this particular item. I know there are a number of people from the community who are interested in this particular item. So uh, without objection, we'll move item G4 to item G2. And Madam Secretary, if you'd read that item, please. Item G4, update on Novak Street speed study. Uh, giving us our information this evening is our Director of Transportation, Ms. Tonique McCullough. Ms. McCullough, you have the floor. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for having me tonight. We were asked to reduce the speed limit on Novak Street, and whenever we're requested to investigate a location for reducing the speed limit, we, uh, go, we will go out and we will collect traffic data, but we will also collect uh, accident data. The traffic data we collected showed that the 85th percentile speed was between 39 and 40 miles per hour on Novak Street. What the 85th percentile speed is, it's the speed at which 85% or are, are more of the drivers are traveling at or below. So when we found that the speed, the 85th percentile speed was at 39 or 40 miles per hour, we also investigated the accidents and determined that there were two reported accidents both in 2011 one involved a hit and run with a mailbox, and the second involved a tractor trailer col uh, colliding with a utility pole. Uh, neither of these uh, incidences we thought would uh, severely be, uh, would have been prevented with the reduction in speed limit. So based upon uh, this, this, our traffic engineering inspection, we uh, could not recommend a reduction in the speed limit below the posted 35 mile per hour speed limit um, as it currently is. What we have done um, is based upon the requests that we've received. We've provided information in your packet uh, so that if the Public Safety Committee wants to consider recommending a reduction in the speed limit, uh, the attached ordinance 
um, for a 25 mile per hour speed limit is included. Uh, Any questions? Well, thank you for that detailed report. Uh, I understand that this item is in Councilmember Burke's ward, so I'll yield to her, Councilmember Burke, but I think there's a question on the floor. Uh, Councilmember Light. Uh, I was intrigued by um, part of your report that says that if the speed cars are traveling is a certain amount above 25 miles per hour requested or whatever, that it's not going to do any good. Yes, ma'am. What we've determined based upon um, traffic engineering studies, based upon uh, standards, we found that uh, motors will travel speeds that they feel comfortable traveling, and that speed is typically uh, at, eight, at the 85th percentile uh, speed limit or lower. Finding, uh, we found that by reducing the speed limits below the 85th percentile speed, it doesn't really change driver patterns. Um, what it will do is probably, um, I guess if there is enforcement, it, there may be some encouragement to, uh, for people to reduce their speeds. But when there isn't any, any enforcement, then you will, people will still drive what they feel comfortable traveling. Mayor Pro Tem Burke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I would like to thank uh, our assistant chief Weaver and Captain James for working along with Mr. Hayes and Dr. Fleming Amin, and I do see Mrs. Uh, Pender here. And they are the residents who met with uh, quite a few people on a Saturday the morning, cold Saturday the morning, to let us know that they're very concerned about their neighborhood. I want to say that Captain James has worked very closely with the residents as well as Chris Mack of the CAO. Now, we do have, just for the records, um, Mr. Chairman since, and members of the committee, since we have several people from the community, would you like to make a comment on why you feel that this is necessary? Bill Pro Tem Burke, uh, we do have a sign-in sheet, and we do have one gentleman who has signed in to speak. Uh, we're, we're, we have a living legend with us. I won't say too much about it, but signed up to speak is Mr. Bill Hayes. And if anyone else wishes to speak, we'll try to keep it brief and uh, keep things moving along. Mr. Hayes is recognized. Good evening, everybody, and I am extremely pleased with the work Ms. Burke and the police department have been doing in our community. You know, for years, I lived there almost 40 years, but for years, I really didn't live there. I was always gone somewhere recruiting or something. So now that I'm retired at home, I'm noticing things. And what, I, what I'm noticing is when I used to have time to walk in our neighborhood, I could get, get up, go right out, walk the neighborhood, no problems. I can't do that anymore. People drive too fast. Um, there's a new development that was built behind us since uh, the, eight, the 90s, and that's a whole different scenario with people coming out of that, young folk coming out of that neighborhood and speeding up and down the street and motorcycles trying to see how fast they can go and the, and the lot. I would say that our community is getting older. It's getting older, and a lot of times when our, my neighbors are trying to back out of their driveway, whew, mm -hmm. you can't do that anymore. I mean, they can't, they can't slowly come out of that driveway because people are up on you so fast, driving so fast. We just feel like that if, if the police don't like to, uh, to arrest someone or ticket someone, when they're going three, four, five miles over speed limit. But it's a big difference between 39 and 35 and, and 40 in a residential neighborhood like we live in. So that's why we want it down to 25, and we think that that might curb some of the speeding because at last resort, we, we uh, would want to do speed humps, but at last resort. So uh, Fleming? Uh, hey, Mr. Hayes, I, I, I may have failed to ask you, but if you just give your name and address for the I'm, record. I'm please. Bill Hayes. Uh, and I live at 5600 Novak Street. Thank you, sir. And, and I've lived there since 1978, but I actually lived there about three or four years. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and Mr. Elamine, if you'd come forward and give your name and address for the record, please. Thank you very much, Chairman Taylor and members of the committee. I'm Fleming Elamine, 5400 Novak Street. I'm a young grandfather. And I walk my grandkids through that neighborhood often. And I try to make a point of walking myself at least three times a week. I try. 
But I walk the neighborhood for two reasons. One, just because it's my neighborhood. Two, I enjoy the community. But three, there's a serious issue with speeding. I don't know what the time frame was when they did the study, but when I walk that neighborhood, I don't see 35 and 39 miles per hour speeders. I see young kids, well, let me rephrase that. I see young adults listen to their music and flying. And I wave at everybody that I pass. I get out of the way, but I wave. There's been an increase in speeding in that community. I live at the end of one section. In fact, the street runs into my house, literally. So I can see the whole street pretty much from my house up until it begins to incline down, decline down. I know it's a hazard. And I, I'm a little disappointed that the transportation results were such that it was just between 35 and 39 above the speed limit. To me, if it's one mile above the speed limit for my grandkids, it's too much. Um, so I would really like the study to be reconsidered and looked upon with a more serious light in terms of children being safe walking through that neighborhood. Specifically, my eight grandkids who come visit me quite often because I fix them blueberry pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a little bias against that. But I, I really would encourage the city to really look at that seriously. Reducing it down to 25 miles per hour, I think we would benefit, safety benefit, at the very minimum. And I hope that you review that audience very closely and give us maximum consideration. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Is there, is there anyone else that wishes to be heard? Uh, if not, uh, we didn't have a formal public comment period, but we'll close it. And I know Councilmember Light wishes to be heard. Uh, what worries me, yes, uh, I have no objection, obviously, to lowering the speed limit, but what worries me is that it's not going to be effective. In which case, and this seems to be a, a perfect place to do a traffic call study, uh, but, uh, you know, I would certainly yield to the residents of the area. Thank you, ma'am. Councilmember McIntosh? As a realtor, I can definitely say that home values are affected by the rate of speed at which people travel through your neighborhood. So something that um, was said that concerns me is that this is a neighborhood that's aging out. So there's going to be some turnover in properties here. And people are not going to realize their, their, their top pricing if, if you've got travel, you've got traffic through there at 39, 40, 45, probably even more miles an hour. So I guess my question also goes to Councilmember Light's question of why are we just looking at 25 mile an hour speed limit signs? Because I think we've all had multiple instances in our, in our wards where we've done traffic studies and we realize, as uh, Ms. McCullough said, however fast people feel comfortable traveling down the street, that's how fast they're going to go. So a, a, a speed limit sign is not going to change their behavior. How do we change their behavior? I think everybody sitting here w would say that we need to change the behavior on this street. Mm -hmm. And so I would, I would propose going a little further and doing a traffic calming study um, to see what else can be done, since we know that the speed limit signs are not going to. I don't think there's any harm in putting speed limit signs up. I just don't think they're going to be effective. All right. I, we'll let Councilman Burke have the final word. Councilman Burke, before we pass it to you, I'll say we, members of the uh, public, we have a couple of different options here. We can look at some additional uh, enforcement. We could also look at a, tra a, tra a traffic calming study. Uh, we have the ability to override the staff decision respectfully and look at a reduction in the speed limit. Councilmember Burke will yield to you because it is in your ward. Yes, yes, thank you so very much. We did talk about uh, calming the traffic out there. And I said to the city manager earlier in reviewing this, and I do appreciate Assistant Chief Weaver bringing that recommendation shortly after we had the meeting. I want the residents to know that to get something done uh, as citizens, we look at it carefully and we as sensitive council people, we know how important this is. I'm gonna make a recommendation that we reduce the speed to 25 and continue with a traffic coming and coming in up the traffic. And also, I'd like to make that motion if I can get a second. I've made second. that Okay, the motion has been made to reduce the speed limit to 25 and properly second. Discussion? Councilmember Burke. Yes, and also the comment of the traffic will be continued with that. And I did say to the residents that Saturday morning, I said, now when the police come out, I want you to keep this in mind. They're going to give you a ticket too. <laughs> and they said, that's all right, because they want their neighborhood to be safe. And I know that uh, we, we have worked on this and we are serious about 
your concern. It's the end of the discussion at this time. All right, members of the committee, there's a motion on the floor. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed us likewise. Uh, that is unanimous, 420, in favor of reducing the speed limit to 25 miles per hour. Thank you. Item G2, please. The original G2. Right. Item G2, 2015 preliminary crime statistics. All right, giving us our update on our 2015 preliminary crime statistics is our police chief, uh, Chief Roundtree. We'll wait just one moment for the room to clear. And Chief, you will have the floor in just one second. All right, Chief, thank you, sir. You have the floor. Good evening. Let Good me evening. Get set up for a second. Take your time. I've done something. <laughs> it, it, it appears we're having some technical difficulties. Uh, Chief, um, unfortunately, we, we love technology, uh, but I was going to say, I guess while the staff is, is working on fixing it, we've got the AV. Uh, gentleman coming in, Mr. Larry, and if you just, oh, okay. Chief, if you want to just give us a brief overview with maybe a, a hard copy so we can kind of move forward in the interest of time. Amen. Yes, again, good, good evening. Good evening. Chairman Taylor and members of the Public Safety Committee. This is a briefing and an overview of our 2015 uh, preliminary crime statistics and they are preliminary because we will be given a detailed report in our annual report once all the numbers are submitted and received from the from the SBI I think we may have it going here in a few seconds We're going to try one more thing, and if not, I'll just walk it through you. No problem. Paper copies. Mr. Manager, do we have some of that fancy elevator music in the interim?
three cheers to Mr. Larry Bell oh, for saving the day. Now. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Chief. Okay. Again, this, these are the preliminary crime stats for 2015. Of course, crime statistics are, are, are divided into two categories uh, from the FBI Uniform Crime Reporting. It divides part one crime, which includes violent crimes and property crimes, and also part two crimes. But the part one crimes are the crimes that the FBI uses to measure the scope and level of crimes that are occurring throughout the United States. Uh, this report will show you that we have seen a slight increase in our crime in 2015 compared to 2014 and, and in some areas in 2013. But we haven't seen some of the double digit increases that some of our sister cities in the state are seeing and also some cities uh, throughout the United States. Uh, briefly, uh, you, you have in front of you just some of the crimes broken down into different categories. Uh, part one crimes, of course, are murders, rape, robberies, and aggravated assaults. And our part one property crimes include burglaries, larcenies, and motor vehicle theft. Our part one violent crime did increase by 6.8 percent from 15 to uh, 2014. Well, compared to 2015, compared to 2014. Overall, our uh, total crime, including part one crime and part two crime, we saw a 0.5% increase. That's total crime, 0.5% increase. We were also asked to pro provide a report that compares uh, crime in a five-year uh, period or time frame. And th this is just a graph, uh, homicides 2015 compared through 2011. This gives you a little bit more information. In 2015, we had 17 homicides. And of course, you can see what we had in 14 through uh, 2011. Our average for the last 10 years has been about 15 homicides per year. In 2015, of course, you do say that we did have 17. Just to give you a little more breakdown as far as the 2015 homicides, we are seeing the majority of our homicides are being committed with uh, firearms. Of course, we 11 were committed with firearms, two personal weapons, uh, three were committed with a knife, and one was a blunt object. Also, you will note that two of the homicides were justifiable homicides where no prosecution will be sought because the person was actually defending themselves. But it does count as a homicide. And Chief, we always say one homicide is one too many. One homicide is too many. Relatively, uh, based on the state average, we're relatively low. Right, among we are low. And I, and I do have a, uh, a slide that will show where we compare to some of our sister cities across the state. Just to give you a breakdown in the demographics, there were 14 males, three females, uh, 11 victims were black, three white, and three Hispanic. Mm -hmm. Chief, if you hold one moment, we have one question. Mayor yes. Pro When you look at the cases, were these within the neighborhood? Did they know each other? Or? We are seeing that a lot of the homicides, they're, um, they're not stranger related. They're, there's some type of connection whether they knew each other and they had an argument. We did have a few where they were uh, domestic related, you know, partnership type homicides also. Just a little information on the offenders uh, so you have a better idea of uh, some of the individuals com uh, c committing the homicides. Nine offenders were black, three white, and three Hispanic. 12 of the 17 homicides in 2015 have been cleared. Our investigative division, they're constantly working to uh, clear the remaining homicides that haven't been cleared for 2015. Winston-Salem compared to other North Carolina cities. Of course, you see Winston-Salem has 17, and you can see the numbers from the other cities uh, in the state. Charlotte's a little different than Winston-Salem, but Durham, Greensboro, and uh, Raleigh, um, our numbers in this category are a lot better than, than cities uh, of similar size in the state. Just a rape comparison, just a brief uh, graph of uh, how those numbers have uh, fluctuated or changed over the past five years. Uh, robberies, uh, we have seen an increase in robberies from 2014, but we did have a, a slight reduction in robberies compared to our 2013 numbers. 
aggravated assaults. Uh, uh, this is one of the categories that has risen the most, where we are seeing some increases. Uh, aggravated assault could include a cutting, a stabbing, uh, the shooting where someone doesn't die. So those numbers have really uh, risen over the past year. We did see a reduction in burglary. I think if you see from your uh, from the second slide, we saw a two point a, a negative two point two percent reduction in burglaries compared to two thousand two thousand and fourteen. Also, those numbers have been reduced over, over the last uh, five years. Our burglary numbers. Larcenies are uh, just a slight increase. Motor vehicle theft, uh, that category, uh, we are showing a negative compared to 2014 in that category. Violent crime overall, uh, slight increase. Violent crime, again, does include murder, rape, robbery, and aggravated assaults. Property crimes about the same uh, compared to 2014, but they, they are reduced uh, compared to 2011 and 2012. Now, part two crime, of course, part two crime includes crimes like simple assaults, forgeries, some embezzlements, uh, some drug offenses, uh, prostitution, those kind of uh, crimes. Uh, just a slight uh, decrease compared to 2014, uh, but pretty much they've made pretty similar through, two, through 2011. Total crime numbers about the same in 2015 compared to 2014. And our arrest trend, this is one area, not only in Winston-Salem, but across the country, we have seen a reduction in, uh, in arrests. Uh, you see in 2014 compared to 2015, just a little over uh, about 2,700 arrests uh, reduction. Uh, part one arrest, of course, you see uh, just a little breakdown compared with the past four years. And then the part two arrests have seen a reduction in, in those also. I know that was quick, uh, but do you have any questions on what I have presented? Yeah, Chief, to what can we attribute the reduction in arrests to? Uh, several things. I don't have any scientific information, but of course, uh, just doing some research and going to different conferences, speaking with different uh, uh, police chiefs across the state and across the country. We think that, that the Ferguson effect, so to speak, or the YouTube effect is causing officers not to engage, uh, not to uh, want their work to be scrutinized, not to be want to uh, appear on TV. And then some of the other things that you see across the country where there's complaints about racial profiling, controversy, controversial uh, stop and frisk, uh, the decriminalization of some offenses in some cities uh, have, have caused arrests to, uh, to go down, uh, police indictments, those kind of things all, contributed, all contribute to police uh, not making as many arrests. Not primarily all of this is what I'm saying in Winston-Salem, but, but just from what some of the national research is saying. And I think we've got a couple more questions, just one additional thing for me. In 2011, uh, back to motor vehicle thefts, they were relatively low based on what we're seeing now. There hasn't been a huge increase in motor vehicle theft, but I would think that the more technology that a vehicle possesses, the more difficult it would be to steal the vehicles. But it seems that they're, they're starting to be more as opposed to less. Talk to me a little bit about that. Um, well, we've seen some where some of the vehicles are being stolen with the keys left in the cars. Um, that has contributed to it also. Some technology has uh, prevented vehicles from being stolen with some of the satellite uh, technology that's in vehicles now. So, so it's kind of really hard to pinpoint the exact cause of it. And if there's a certain type of vehicle that, that's being stolen, I know you don't have that information this time. The next time you bring the report, if you could just maybe let us know so we can inform the public, we don't want to create a sense of panic, but sometimes people like to know they're more likely to be victimized sure. based on certain uh, characteristics. Councilman Belay. Yeah, don't buy a Mercedes or something. <laughs> yeah. that. I wouldn't say that. No. <laughs> um, at, at Chief, when we do get the uh, final report, and I understand this is preliminary, could we get your statisticians at, uh, to uh, include standard deviations on these numbers 
on the averages. Yes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions at this time? Councilman McIntosh. I remember for a long time the Oldsmobile Cutlass was the most stolen <laughs> okay, car great. out there. It looks like our numbers in comparison to Durham and Greensboro are really the, they're, they're, they're most closely our peers in terms, of, um, in terms of population and we're way below those. Yes, for North Carolina cities, yes. What do you attribute the Raleigh numbers to? I mean, have you spoken with their chief and do you have any sense of why they're what, three times the size of us and have a similar number of, of homicides? I haven't spoken with her uh, personally, but uh, normally Raleigh normally leads us. I think they had a good year yeah. for 2015. Okay. And finally, does, or, do you have cause for concern with the decrease in the number of arrests? I do. Um, I know we've seen in some cities across the country where they had a uh, decrease in arrests, crime really skyrocketed. You know, that was evident in uh, Baltimore after the uh, incident with Freddie Gray, you know, arrest stopped, but they had 40 homicides in a month. So uh, I don't think it's a, a, a widespread problem here, but I think it is some concerns with uh, So we hope it's not a with precursor. That. Right. The things we're going to see down the road. Has there been a corresponding <clears throat> drop in the activity level in our court system? I know that some of my constituents have been aggravated by the fact that people that get popped for burglaries end up right back out on the street because the court system can't process them or that seemingly they get let out um, you know, relatively easily. So are we making up any ground there? Well, we get frustrated too. You know, we arrest a person know, one day yeah. and uh, they're right back out causing a lot of the problems that we uh, experience in the city. But you know, that's part of the, the process and some of the things that have to occur here to make sure that everything is run smoothly. So you haven't seen any increase in sentencing based on the fact that there's the courts have probably more time to work with and a little more jail space not necessarily All right. I was afraid of that <laughs> thank you and also Constable McIntosh it appears that burglaries are down and part two total crimes are down yeah, that's so maybe I'm an optimist but I'd like to think that the reduction in arrests means that people are committing less crimes in the city of Winston-Salem we'll wait for your final report to tell us otherwise chief All right. Mayor Pro Tem Burke Yes, I was going to say to the chief, um, looking at this report, how do you feel? We're not going to compare with other cities. Uh, do you think it's because you're giving it such leadership that, that uh, this police are trained well? Or I, I would hate to think with the many things that we have done in this city and how we have been open wanting to spend the tax dollars because we see that as an important department. We know we can always improve, but I have thought with the training, with the uh, police who work with you, with their own passion for the job, the sensitivity, that we don't have to, we compare, but is it anything that you can see that you've been doing with your chiefs and captains and your workforce? Well, I don't like to take a lot of credit, but, but I can say that uh, we do have a lot of dedicated men and women that work in the West Salem Police Department. We have great uh, leadership. We have great training. So I think all of that has contributed to um, some of the successes that we've seen across the city. Yes, because, Mr. Chairman, when we look at cities that are having some of these problems across the country, some of the things that they're talking about introducing, we have mm -hmm. We've done. I have said to the mayor, actually, we could be uh, an example. We have also sent information to the United States Attorney General to let him know the kinds of things he's telling other cities and bringing folks together because maybe some police uh, don't want to do their job. But I don't think we have put any type of pressure on our police not to do their job. As long as they're doing their jobs, we have e equipment, we have certain technology that we can use to help them to do the job. And I've said that um, our city can be an example. We look at some of the other cities. We're not even going to look at Shaw. And um, some of the things they do in Durham. But maybe I like to think that we are training and we're getting people who are interested in doing the job. Yes. Leadership. 
And, and finally, Mayor Pro Temp Burke, I would also add that I believe that we have some of the brightest and best officers in uh, the United States of America. This committee and this city has also focused on our efforts to support reentry, to ensure that we're reducing recidivism. Uh, we've also put in place a crime lab where you know we're getting cases through uh, the court system more quickly, and we're dealing justice out to those who deserve it on both sides of the fence. We've also moved to the district police office concept. That concept has not yet been implemented, uh, but people know it's coming. And I think all of it combined says that we're concerned about safety in this community, and we're taking steps with the manager's leadership and with the chief's leadership uh, toward making sure that we're making this city more livable and more safe. So thank you for bringing that up. Council Rebecca. Right, but one last item. I know it's not, your, your group is not able to make a change on this, but it would be really nice to have the cameras installed downtown. I mean, I know that's a state issue, yep. like so many things we deal with, but, you know, after the incident we just had, um, I think that's an extra push to get that instituted. I know it won't necessarily stop crime, but it can help us um, in the prosecution there. So, yes, we've been working real hard. If it was up to me, we'd have had them up yeah, I know. probably yeah. a year ago. But exactly. what I'm looking at doing now is at least starting in our three uh, parks downtown. And you know we still maybe maybe to catch some of the area, yeah. the primary area that that we would like to focus on along Fourth Street also. I mean that's another tool to go back to the conversation about how uh, Winston Salem has led the way, what a lot of other people are talking about instituting. We've already done. So thank you for being a leader on that. Thank you. Well, Paul Tim, you you got the final word. All right, but I failed to mention our game committee. We want we were one of the cities who initiated it, and we were amended by the state as being forward. And so when we're doing things, I think it's so important for the public to know, for us to tell the story. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Chief. All right. Thanks, All right. Chief. Uh, our final item this evening is item G3. Madam Secretary, if you read the item, please. Item G3, 2015 Emergency Management Year-End Review. All right. Uh, and giving us our 2015 year-end review, uh, from the emergency management perspective is our director, uh, Mr. Mel Sattler. Uh, Mr. Sattler, as soon as the chief gets you up and running, uh, you have the floor, sir. I can get his running. I couldn't get mine. <laughs> <laughs> you learn fast. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, <clears throat> we, we prepared a multi-page, well, I should show you, the staff prepared a multi-page document uh, for year in review, and we submitted it to management. and. Uh, they ask us to come before the Public Safety Committee and can present a condensed version <laughs> of that multi-page document, which is what we're about to do. This won't take long. Uh, <clears throat> we just have a few things we wanted to highlight, and uh, we'll move into that as quickly as possible. First thing is our mission statement. Uh, emergency management, and I won't read it to you. Aid, aid, well, I will read it, that part of it. Aids the community before, during, and after unusual events and major disasters through creditable education services open communications and cooperative efforts. That sounds pretty simple, but it involves a lot more, or it's a lot more complicated than it may sound. The big thing that we wanted to emphasize here, of course, is the fact that we're uh, engaged, we being the United States, and as well as each state and each county, uh, engaged in mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery activities constantly. There's a cycle that just goes around and around and around. Most specifically, in our office, we have five members, uh, five staff members. I am the director, and of course, we have an administrative assistant, and we have three emergency management coordinators, uh, and you will meet one in just a moment, and the other two weren't, are not here with us tonight. During the course of 19, uh, <laughs> behind times, 2015, <laughs> the staff attended a total of 17 training courses, uh, and there may have been some multiple attendees also which is a good deal of training when you think about it for the course of one calendar year. We had furthermore two of our staff members who were distinguished during the course of this past year, one of those being Leah Cordell, who was our emergency management director for our emergency management coordinator for uh, logistics. She completed the emergency management institute training for basic training for emergency management uh, coordinators. Uh, that involves some online training as well as two two-week periods at Emmitsburg. I think some of you have been there, and <clears throat> that, that, I think that's commendable, and she has completed that basic training. Our uh, One of the other coordinators, Michelle Brock, has completed the educational requirements and the other accoutrements that were involved in terms of becoming a certified emergency management uh, 
or receiving her certified emergency management coordination coordinator certification. And she is also a member of the city's effort now for career building, uh, which is the mentoring program. We responded basically to 27 specific incidents last year, and they're all weather related. I won't read them to you. Most of the first part is uh, our routine activities, with the exception, of course, of an airplane crash, which we had on Labor Day last year, and a few other items which you might not be aware of, including an industrial fire with injuries. Uh, we had several apartment fires. We had an assisted living evacuation and a meth lab, and as well as an, an emergency operations center activation. And we'll talk about a minute about uh, what brought that on. Other activities, <clears throat> we participated in and coordinated 29 uh, local, state, or federal drills, exercises, or whatever throughout through the year. That's quite, that's a pretty heavy load, you know, when you think about it. That's more than two per month on an average, and that's a lot of work. Uh, we coordinated 16 training courses in the county and the city. And we coordinated two, two community events. And in just a moment, we'll talk about what those were. And we uh, participated in 15 emergency management related or community events. We evacuated or managed three state and federal grant, uh, excuse me, executed <laughs> or managed three state or federal grants, which were uh, outside funds coming into the city and the county, which we were able to use for the betterment of the emergency management community. We delivered planning assistance to more than 20 facilities and business and agencies and organizations upon their request. Uh, we don't compete with private industry, but the same token, when we are asked or requested by industries or other stakeholders in the community to assist them with the requirements that they have to meet, we're more than happy to do that. And we also participated in primary coordination for 32 program uh, or uh, initiatives of various types. One of the things I want to emphasize, uh, as I mentioned a minute ago, there are only there are five people in our office, but when you look at the definition of emergency management, you realize that there are an awful lot of private stakeholders as well as other public and private agencies that are involved in emergency management. So it's not just the things that the five of us do, but it's the entire community and the efforts that are put forth on a state, uh, rather on a uh, federal, state, and local level for the betterment of the community and for our own protection. Now, uh, one of our coordinators, who I mentioned a minute ago, Michelle Brock, is going to give you some specifics as far as what went on in 2015, and I ask her to keep it brief also. Ms. Brock, you have the floor. Thank you, and good evening. Good evening. As you've probably heard Mel say, <laughs> um, thank you for being here and paying attention to what emergency responders need and ask for and suggest in the city. I have the honor and the privilege to work with a lot of fine people. We have a, a good group of emergency responders in this city. And so um, I appreciate everything they do on a daily basis. Um, a lot of them work in the field and they risk their lives on a daily basis. So um, it's much appreciated and much understood from the emergency management perspective. And as Mel also said, um, emergency management is about all of us. We're all part of that system. and so. It's not just the five people in our office that are emergency managers. We're all emergency managers, and we need all of your help. And we so appreciate your support, um, especially over the past year. We've had a lot of emergency management support from the Public Safety Committee, so we appreciate that. And special thanks um, to the chair and to Council Member Light. Um, since I've been in the office, they have been part of our advisory council. And they make good suggestions and ask com they make comments and ask questions um, as they should. And so we appreciate their participation in that. Okay, Mel gave me the pictures because I'm a simple person and I like pictures. Um, it's a lot better than just words on a, on a piece of paper. So um, this is an incident that occurred in February with a fuel oil truck and a Pepsi truck. Um, you know, we deal with injuries and fatalities. This one didn't happen to have a fatality, um, but one of the truck drivers was airlifted off the scene. Um, it involved an oil spill and an acid spill, and I think some battery uh, fluid as well. So um, that just gives you an idea of some of the things that we see. In June, it was extremely hot. Our Winston-Salem hazmat team had to respond out to this. It was actually um, in an unincorporated area of Forsyth County. It was a hexamine spill, which was a new chemical to all of us. 
you know, we get surprises from time to time, and this chemical was not in our emergency response guidebook um, that the firefighters and the police officers and the EMS folks use um, when they come in contact with hazardous materials. Um, it turned out that hexamine is supposedly non-toxic, and so the truck was not placarded. <coughs> so it didn't tell emergency responders that it was a dangerous chemical or could be a dangerous chemical. Um, we did have emergency responders that had to be treated at the hospital. Um, and to give you an idea of some of the things that we deal with, not only the emergency itself, but dealing with social media. Um, there was social media repercussions from this. Raleigh was calling us on the scene and asking us um, who are these two emergency responders that um, have been injured and been transported by ambulance. So things go across the state very, very quickly because of social media. So those are some of the things that we have to think about as well. Hexamine, um, this chemical breaks down into formaldehyde and ammonia. So it was actually dangerous for the environment. And it's labeled as non-toxic. It was because it, the chemical itself, before it reaches air and has been exposed to a lot of air and to the soil, then it's, it's hexamine and it's, it's a certain compound. Um, when it is exposed to that, it breaks down into those two different, the ammonia and the formaldehyde, which is very dangerous or can be very dangerous. Um, and because this was out in the county, uh, the, the resident that was the closest was on well water. Um, we also had a farm downstream, so we had to think about agricultural repercussions. Um, so we had a lot of state agencies, including the EPA, that were involved in this, um, this particular spill. And our hazmat team was wiped out. It was, it was June, and it's the kind of weather where you walk outside and sweat rolls down your back. Um, so they were whipped from that incident, and we had to call in a regional hazmat team to supplement. Oh. Our EOC activation, so our emergency operations center was activated uh, for the first time in years uh, for Moral Monday. And that was one of those things where we um, open it up so that we can support our emergency responders to make sure if anything happens or comes of that event, then uh, we have the resources there at our fingertips uh, that we can put in place if we have to. Social media was also monitored. Um, we do that when we have EOC activations um, because the public knows things, they say things, they see things, and they post it. And we want to know what the public's saying for things like that. So um, that was a very good test. So we're very happy nothing happened, um, but it was also a very good test for, for our EOC staff. Um, our office also conducts exercises. Um, we did a co-location exercise in July at, in Walkertown, it's at Walkertown High School, and co-location means we were simulating the sheltering of people with animals. Because when people evacuate, they take their animals, and you have to be able to accommodate those, just like you have to be able to accommodate functional needs for people as well. So that was a very good test um, of our sheltering system. Uh, we are also putting together an incident management team, a county-wide team. Um, a lot of those folks that are on that team are from the city of Winston, city of Winston responders. And so these are the, it's kind of like if you've ever heard of an overhead team. Those folks that come together, it's, it's a very compact, almost an EOC, but they can um, go out to the sites where some really bad damage has occurred and um, make sure that that incident is being handled. So you have your logistics, your planning, your operations, and those kinds of folks in there. So we're providing that kind of training countywide. Um, as Mel mentioned, uh, we had the plane crash um, on Labor Day. Um, there were three fatalities with that. It's very unfortunate. Um, first plane crash that I've been involved with, with the office. And so it was a sobering event, um, and we had to coordinate. It was a federal investigation, so we had to make sure that there was security and that kind of thing there. Um, Dr. Ben Carson, um, presidential hopeful, did visit in September. Um, we do things like this, so for planned events, then we put together incident action plans and pull the responders together and say, if so and so happens, we want to make sure that we've got our bases covered. So. Um, 
we did some planning with that and um, I know Winston-Salem Police Department was involved in that as well along with several other response agencies. Um, we focus a lot and have this past year on crisis communications. Um, so we've done a lot of social media training, public information officer training, um, and joint information center training. So these folks, when something happens, they know what to say to the media, they know um, who to talk about, <laughs> who they can't talk about, and that kind of thing. So we want to make sure all of our responders and our stakeholders in the emergency management system are familiar um, with those types of things. Um, and this is one of our, um, just one of our initiatives from our office. Um, several years ago, I put together um, what's called the Piedmont Emergency Animal Response Team. And so this is a regional group uh, with 14 counties. Forsyth County happens to be one of those counties and we have a lot of volunteers in the animal realm that want to make sure that we can provide for animals when we have emergencies and disasters. So we train from everything from small animal to large animal. So those um, horses and those cows that get stuck in the mud and that kind of thing, um, they learn how to do those technical rescue things so that they're not getting hurt. You know, that's paramount that our emergency responders are as safe as they can be and that they help that animal and get it out of the situation that it's in safely. Active assailant um, video, this was put together at the end of last year, um, involved um, multiple agencies um, from across the county. Um, and you know this is an up and coming thing. These terrible things are happening across the country and around the world. And we wanna make sure that our emergency responders are as prepared as possible and trained as best as they can be. Um, so our office helped to coordinate a video, and I don't know if you've seen it, um, if you haven't, you might want to ask, ask about that because that would be a good thing for you to um, take a look at. But our emergency responders have certain tactics that they need to use for, for things like that. And so we put together a video so that they can train each other appropriately. And if you haven't been to readyforsife.org, please, please visit our website. There's a lot of good information there on preparedness, um, the things that we do year round, um, and a lot of information about um, how to prepare for emergencies. So if you're not prepared at home, you need to be that way because we're gonna need you when it hits the fan, okay? Thank you, Mrs. Brock. Uh, we're gonna ask Mr. Saller to come back to the podium. Mr. Saller, I'll kick it off. This is something else that I, I borrowed and almost have stolen from Councilmember Burke. Of course, to those who might be watching, uh, the Emergency Management Department is a joint venture between the city and the county uh, designed to respond to unusual events and emergency management disasters. Uh, Mr. Saller, question number one, are we prepared? We believe so. Uh, events change frequently and constantly, and situations and circumstances are evolving uh, frequently. So we've got to stay abreast of what's going on, what changes are being made, what techniques are being changed, and we believe that we're able to stay on top of that. We feel like compared to a number of our colleagues, we're ahead. Of course, that's our own, our own version of that. But uh, nonetheless, yes, I think we can say confidently that we are prepared. We've got our fine partners here, uh, along with others, with whom we work on a regular basis. I believe that with the efforts of all those combined, we're, we're uh, we, yes, we can say that we are prepared. Councilman Blake. Um, I, I was actually <clears throat> just going to ask about this video. Is that on ready for sight? No, that's no. not for public viewing. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> We can arrange for you to see it, but it's, it's not really designed for public viewing because there's some techniques and some other information that we're, that's not uh, available right. to the public. And Councilman Relate, I've just got word uh, that we can get that video sent. So if, okay. if Chief, if you'll have it sent to everyone and Mr. Seller and Mr. Mr. Manager. Yes, sir. Any other questions at this time? No comments. I'm just gonna say thank you. Thank you, for you. Thank you Mr. Seller. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, is there anything else uh, that needs to be said or discussed for the good of the order? One other thing. Councilman Burke is recognized. I asked the city manager to just briefly tell us about I-74. I also brought this picture here that's in my office downstairs showing the future of I-74. And it has some of our elected officials there. <laughs> we have um, Larry Wampler. 
Dalton Ruffin, he was on the DOT, Vivian Burke, Robert Northerton, and we have Lambert, but I'm trying to see, is this Burke? Who is it? Who is it? Look like uh, Burke. And this man, I think, is a um, mayor from one. Who is he? Let's see. The little fella. Larry, Larry Williams. Williams. Yeah, Mayor, Mayor yeah. Rule, Rule Hall. Mm. Yes. Yeah. That's and a young met, Larry Williams. <laughs> <laughs> and we met up there, and I thought it was interesting. You want to see? It? Please. That uh, now that I 74 is coming to where we seek it, and I asked the city manager just to address that, please. Absolutely, Councilman Burke. As you pointed out, the city has been working for many, many years. There were a lot of twists and turns uh, to get I-74 funded, the, what we call the Northern Beltway. Uh, it was this year finally approved um, in Raleigh to fund the eastern leg, the complete eastern leg of the, of the Northern Beltway. Um, the many groups have worked together. The city has been a leader working with the business community, the county, the Chamber of Commerce uh, to get that uh, funded. If you recall, back in 2014, this council passed a resolution urging the state to, to fund the Northern Beltway. This, a study was uh, undertaken a couple years back by the chamber and others uh, estimating the annual impact of just, just the eastern leg of the Northern Beltway. And it has an estimated impact just for Forsyth County, because there's, it'll impact other counties as well, but just for our county of 135 million. Some of that will be within the city of Winston-Salem, some will be in the county, but that's a, that's a large impact the permanent, permanent cumulative economic boost is over two and a half billion dollars and they estimate for the whole region that constructing that, that road will create up to 33,000 new jobs. So it's a major impact and thanks to the work of this council and as Councilmember Burke pointed out, it's been going on for a long time. It's going to finally come to fruition. Yes, I thought that was interesting, Mr. Chairman. Great news and I know it will be very beneficial to our southern, eastern and southeastern portions of the city. Uh, which often and more importantly benefits the city at large. So we're very happy that you brought that up and we're very excited about this leg of uh, I-74. Is there any further business that's necessary to discuss for the good of the order? Seeing none, I hereby consider this meeting of the Public Safety Committee to be adjourned.